Good morning, everybody. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you all. Um, I figured it would be a good opportunity to start the year with a psalm. So would you stand with us as we enter into worship this morning? From Psalm... Oh my. Mic drop. <laughs> okay, so from Psalm 103, David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Okay. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, he repay, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassions to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And friends, this morning, I want to uh, start partially because it leads perfectly into the next song, but um, I think it's good to remember that the Lord is good and he has been good to us. Yeah. 
seat for a moment. I'm going to yak a little bit. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our very first day and Sunday of the new year. I just realized it's not the first day of the new year, it's the second day, but it's our first Sunday together and I'm glad to be here with you all. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, so last week I talked about these bookmarks that can be found at that apparatus back there on the wall, there's some stuff there. Um, if you are looking to read the Bible and you don't know where to start, somebody, um, probably named Wayne, because I, I think that's his company, but uh, created this bookmark called the Life Journal Bookmark. And um, I did my reading for yesterday, and the first chapter of Luke, y'all, is so long, can I just say? But the good news is I was reminded of that as I was reading. And so I, if I had my handy-dandy pen, I could mark off that I read my reading for yesterday. And so if you're interested in one of these, you can feel free to pick one up uh, anytime during the service. If you have a smartphone, you can also, uh, through the YouVersion Bible app, you can look up Life Journal. And you can also follow along with the rest of us and just start that whenever you start it. And so that's these. Following up with that, we have some brand new journals that have our logo on it. Um, because I really believe that, you know, I, I love anchors. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But um, the really cool thing is that when you're reading God's word and you're engaging with that he actually wants to talk to you through that experience and so if you want to write it down there are some of these little cashier journal things on the back wall as well if you don't have a physical bible and you want one we have free bibles right next door to these in the back and so feel free to pick that up if we somehow run out today i don't think it's going to happen but if it does let me know, and we will get you a Bible. We will get you more of these. We have some more of these. And so um, I just want to equip you as best as you can as you pursue God in this new year. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, another thing I just want to mention is that we have these Connect cards in the pew in front of you. If you have a prayer request um, that you would like, either the team of us who meet on Thursday nights at 5.30 to pray over that. Um, you can jot that down, whatever's going in, on in your life. It doesn't have to be medical related, although if you have medical issues, please share with us if you feel comfortable with that. Um, but also there's just, you know, some information that would help me be able to connect with you throughout this week or the coming weeks. And so if you want to connect with us, fill one of these out, put it in the offering box that's on that back table on my left, your right, in the back there. It says offering in really colorful letters. It's really great. So anyway, um, things coming up this week. We are starting up again with prayer at 5.30 on Thursday nights. We're also starting up again in our Bible study on Thursday night at 7.00. In the book of Revelation, we are chugging along, and we're finally at chapter 6. Woo! Yeah. <sighs> Only like 14 chapters to go, or 18 chapters, I can't remember. Anyway, but we're having a fun time with it. If you're interested in that, feel free to drop by. You don't have to have any homework done ahead of time. 
just show up, we'll read, and we'll talk, and it'll be a good old time. Also, KFC, Kids for Christ, is starting back up on Wednesday, um, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, there will be food, and the kids will have a chance to learn about God. So I think that's all the announcements that... Oh, no, that's not... Um, so this coming Saturday, the 9th, 8th, thank you, my lovely wife slash secretary. Um, uh, so on the 8th at 9 o'clock, we're going to be de-decking the halls. And so if you would like to help out with that, there's no obligation, but if you want to help out with that um, and stand on a ladder and maybe take down some lights or different things. Um, nine o'clock Saturday, you're welcome, and it'll be fun. So um, we'd love to see you there. And with that, let's go ahead and continue in worship. Would you stand with us?
upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Praise you, Lord. Wonderful, so wonderful is your. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully
presence. All of my gains now fade away. Every crown no longer on display. Here in your presence, heaven is trembling in awe.
जी प्लीज सी गए I pulled one of these things. I didn't have my mic on. Look at you guys go. The people online will know, and they'll probably comment and say, hey, no sound. What's going on? Anyway, so when I was in college, I, was, I started going to this prayer group led by a friend of mine named Jeremiah. And at the time, this was a long time ago now, but um, there was this book by an author named Donald Miller, titled Blue Like Jazz. If you want to know a formative book that has like formed and shaped my life, this one was one of the starts. It was this and C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity in my uh, freshman year of college that just really, it took the stuff that I had been sort of developing in high school and how God had been meeting me where I was and really started to put legs to my journey and actually connecting more with him. And so I want to share, he writes in the book, I'm not going to read from the book, I'm going to have it up here on the slides, but uh, I want to share a children's story that's kind of like a fable or an allegory, I don't, anyway, it, it's in a kid's style thing and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Go ahead, Richard. All right. Maybe. Hold, please. Here we go. There once was a rabbit named Don Rabbit. Next. Good. Don Rabbit went to Stumptown Coffee every morning. Amen. One morning at Stumptown, Don Rabbit saw Sexy Carrot. And Don Rabbit decided to chase Sexy Carrot. But Sexy Carrot was very fast. And Don Rabbit chased Sexy Carrot all over Oregon. And all over America, all the way to New York City. And Don Rabbit chased Sexy Carrot all the way to the moon. And Don Rabbit was very, very tired. But with one last burst of strength, Don Rabbit lunged at Sexy Carrot and Don Rabbit caught Sexy Carrot. And the moral of the story is that if you work hard, stay focused, and never give up, you eventually will get what you want in life. Unfortunately, shortly after this story was told, Don Rabbit choked on the carrot and died. So the second moral of the story is sometimes the things we want most in life are the things that will kill us. <laughs> Woo! That is my really great, awkward introduction to my, my talk this morning. Go ahead and go to the next slide. 
Okay, so the title for today's message is called Inside Out Purity. Our passage is going to be Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together this morning is that our lives are redeemed or ruined in our hearts. Our lives are redeemed or ruined in our heart. You can go to the next slide. So we were in a series starting in October called The Kingdom Manifesto. Since August, we've been on a journey through the gospel according to Matthew in the New Testament in the Bible. And we reached this portion where we've been pretty much going through all of the Christmas story. So we've done it twice this year, friends. No, last year. Ha ha. Here we go. So it's a new year. <laughs> so we made it through Jesus' uh, birth, his, uh, his eventual baptism, which is where the Holy Spirit came down upon him. He was led into the wilderness. He was tempted. He rose victorious and um, uh, or proved victorious. Rising comes later in the Gospels, as you may know. And so then Jesus starts his ministry in the region of Galilee, um, which is in the north, which is really around where Jesus grew up anyway, because Jesus grew up in the town of Nazareth, which was around that area. And so he settled in the city of Capernaum, and he started his preaching and teaching ministry there, and he was healing and casting out demons, and it's all very fun, all very good, and you can read more about it or catch up on past sermons if you'd like to know more. But Jesus, we get to this point in Matthew chapter 5 where we start this, we get this teaching that of Jesus, it's either a collection of teachings or maybe it is, he did it all in one fell swoop, but it's this big chunk of teaching where we get to actually hear what Jesus Christ himself had to say. Now, it wasn't always exhaustive, as, as we'll see, um, because he wasn't trying to give you every single detail of every little thing. It was more covering with a broad stroke saying, here's these topics about God's kingdom, which as John the Baptist had preached and Jesus had picked up that teaching as well, that the kingdom of heaven was near, which means that the kingdom of heaven is now, and Jesus had come to start that, that kingdom. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And so here we have this comparison. So in the Sermon on the Mount, there's the list of blessings. You can go back and learn about that. But the big thrust of the Beatitudes, or the blessings that Jesus starts his teaching with, is it introduces this idea that the kingdom of heaven is this is this culture that's completely counter to what we would expect from what we experience here on earth as people in a fallen, broken uh, world full of the human condition. And so what had been happening was you had people like the Pharisees, uh, teachers of religious law, who were very rigid to make sure that people did not fail to do the law. And so they were like, you have to follow the law of Moses. There's my Charlton Heston Moses. I love that movie. And he's pointing the finger and eventually he throws the commandments like a, a Bible thumper, just, you will know the Lord. And so, um, but the, <laughs> the Pharisees, they were saying, letter of the law, what does it say? That's what we're going to do. Oh, and if there's confusion on it, we're going to interpret it, and then whatever we say is that interpretation, then you have to do that thing. So Jesus comes. He is bringing us this perspective of the kingdom of heaven, and he's teaching about it, and he is in this section giving about six different case studies of where God said something in the Old Testament 
And he's not erasing that. He's saying, yes, that stands. But then he's expanding upon it. You can go to the next slide. Because oftentimes the Pharisees would stop short at, okay, if you complete this physical obedience, you've gone as far as you have to go. So Jesus, in these six case studies, he makes these, it's this teaching pattern. He says, you have heard it said, this, but I say to you. And so there is this, this, uh, we're not there yet. Back, okay. Um, There's this understanding that God's word is true, God's word is good, and there is purpose to what God has said, and he's not erasing it, but he is expanding our understanding of what that thing is. And so, um, just before we took a break from the series, <laughs> we covered the topic of anger, and so if you want to look back at that, it's on the website. And today, we have the awkward, there's no good time to step back into this, folks. Uh, we get to talk about adultery. And so, thanks, love. <laughs> thanks. Oh, I love you guys, too. So, um, so with that being said, gird yourselves, buckle up, because it's going to be a fun ride. So, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew 5. We're going to begin in verse 27. We're not going very far. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Uh, If you'd like to follow along with that, you can find it on the screen. Uh, But also, whatever Bible you read is good. So, here we go. Jesus speaking, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Pause. So that's a direct quotation from the Ten Commandments. That's a direct quotation from also in Deuteronomy where God repeats the law. And so that's direct quotation. Jesus is not doing away with that. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Think Don Rabbit and Sexy Carrot. Don Rabbit already had plans to consume that carrot, y'all. Okay, now, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So we're going to define some terms. Uh, One of the things that I love to do, and I I don't know if I'm going to start it up again this January, but I love to read through the book of Proverbs. Um, I'll get more into that. But one of the things that Solomon, in all of his wisdom, says to uh, his son that he's speaking to, he says, son, beware of the immoral woman, beware of her lashes. And it just so happens that these words could form the word lash. And so we're looking at four words that I want to define before we go much further. And that is the word lust, adultery, sin, and heart. Beware of those lashes, y'all. So um, first term, go ahead. Yes, proceed. All right, so the word lust in the Greek means to long for, to lust after, to covet an object. And it's the Greek word epithumeo, which is made up of two, it's a combination of two words. One is upon, or location on the surface of an object, and thumos, which is passion, as if breathing hard, or an intense desire. And so, It's like, uh, hold on, hold on, we're not there yet. I'm still talking about lust. Here we go. So, (laughs) here we go. 
So it's kind of like when you, here's an example. So last night, Angie has been starting to try to eat clean, okay? And last night I was working on my sermon a little bit, and we had some leftover cheesecake from from all the festivities that we've been a part of the last couple of days. And I can't remember exactly what she said, but she basically said, you're mean. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, at different times, like, if she was completely starved of cheesecake and all sugar, then seeing cheesecake, which she loves so dearly, she'd be like, I need that cheesecake. Um, But I digress. So that's lust. It's, It's very similar to coveting because you're lusting after or you're desiring a thing that is not yours and it's not yours to be had. And it's something that it, in Scripture, there's only, I think, three or four times that it's ever used in a good sense. It's always, almost always used to refer to a, a bad or twisted desire, something that shouldn't be. Okay, now you can go to the next slide. Then there, no, nope, nope, back. Okay, adultery. Okay, so that is to have unlawful intercourse with another's wife. It was also used as a Hebrew idiom or saying for those who at a woman's solicitation are drawn away to idolatry, that is to the eating of things sacrificed to idols. Interesting thing, I don't know how to say that Greek word. Moicheuo? I don't know. But what is it? Moicheuo? Okay. Thank you, Rob. Love you, brother. So, um, The interesting thing about this is that it's the same word that's used in reference to Revelation when they're talking about the woman Jezebel, which is a character type in in Scripture. She was a real person, but where she was drawing away people to worship the Baals back in the Old Testament. And so you have this it's not good. It's this immoral woman. It's this drawing away. It's this enticement to have this um, intercourse with another's wife. Um, Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, Next, sin. So the interesting thing here, the NIV, which I grew up reading the NIV, um, they actually got it kind of right. So this word can mean either to entice sin or cause to sin or cause to stumble, to give offense and to fall away. Now, we're really used to the idea of sin being that missing of the mark where God sets the standard and we miss it, where we're throwing the dart and we miss that bullseye, right? But in, in this passage, Jesus uses this word, scandaliso, which is scandalous, to say the least. But um, it's this causing to stumble. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And last but not least, heart. Um, The locus of a person's thoughts, volition, emotions, and knowledge of right from wrong. Um, That's where you find a person's mind or their conscience. And all of that is understood, that core of a person's being. Uh, It's the Greek word cardia is it it wasn't uh, i I was reading another lexicon dictionary that basically said in scripture it's never used to reference a actual physical organ it's always a spiritual sense it's always that core inner being of a person okay go ahead and go to the next slide there okay the first thing i get from what jesus taught is that God wants to do more than just regulate our behaviors. He wants to redeem and reform our hearts. Um, Because our hearts are where sin is conceived. You can go to to the next slide. There's this passage in Mark's gospel, Mark 7, 14 through 23, that says, For from within, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, from within... 
out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, what's interesting, no, I think I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so here, there's something core going on. There's something on the inside that's very wrong, that's twisted, that's not the way it was supposed to be. You can go to the next slide. So when God created us in the beginning, if you were reading your life journal bookmark, you would have covered Genesis 1 yesterday, Genesis 1 and 2, where we were created in the image of God, perfect, whole, good, as we were supposed to be. God called us very good, and we were made in His image, and we were supposed to reflect God's character to the world. One interesting thing is that one of God's characteristics, if you were to kind of summarize things in his, the way he interacts with us, is that God is faithful, that he's true to his word, that he is never going to let you down, and he is trustworthy, he is faithful. But sin entered the, the program. Sin entered the picture. And so we have since become ruined reflections of God. And so with our sin, one of the primary motivating factors of sin is that it's selfish and it, it promotes unfaithfulness. And that's why I think Jesus is highlighting in all of his case studies, he could have chosen all from the 400 different laws that were in the Old Testament, he chose this one because I think it's such a core issue. You can go to the next slide. God wants us to deal decisively with our sin. And so, in Jesus' teaching, he says, basically, you know, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent, has already committed adul adultery in his heart, which means that it's, it's an inward thing. It's not something that's been acted on, but the act has already been committed in the heart. But then Jesus, so if it's just a heart issue, then why is Jesus talking about eyes and hands? I think it's because with in our physical bodies there's a connection between what our eyes and hands experience and the capacity to act on those intentions or those attitudes that that actually leads us toward action to acting out whatever is on our heart and so if we were to take it literally, Jesus is saying, basically, self-harm, bodily mutilation, to try to fix the sin. But really what he's doing here is he's using a literary device, praise God, um, called hyperbole, where he's exaggerating a little bit. Kind of like what he did with anger, um, where he said, if you're angry, if you're going to sacrifice your, your offering and you, somebody has something against you, go the 90 miles home or so to be able to reconcile with the brother. He's using exaggeration here. And so, but he does say that if your eye causes you to sin or stumble, that you're supposed to gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, you're supposed to cut it off. What that, I think, really means, if we're using the literary device right, is not to actually do those self-harm things. What it really is, is to say you need to deal decisively with your sin. That if, like, really there's a heart issue going on, but as you go through this world, if you need to make some changes to help guard your heart, then you need to make those 
changes. Also in the book of Proverbs, there's this, uh, this verse in Proverbs 4.23 that says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And this piece of wisdom, what I love about it is that your heart, even though that was in Hebrew, but in, in that ancient mind, if your heart is the core of who you are and everything you do flows from it, then that means that you need to tend to your heart. You need to make sure that you're, you're adjusting your life and making decisions so that you can not be led into sin, to not stumble. So we'll, we'll talk more about that, but go to the next slide here. Uh, everybody that I've heard teach on this uses this quote from Martin Luther in his commentary on Matthew 5. Martin Luther uh, said this, we should not make the bolstering of Jesus' teachings too taut here, which means too tight. As if anyone is merely tempted to look at another with lust as eternally damned. And here's the great part. I cannot keep a bird from flying over my head, but I can certainly keep it from making a nest in my hair. And he didn't have a lot of hair, folks, but making a nest in my hair or from biting off my nose. We need to deal decisively with our sin. Go to the next slide. So, a uh, couple of years ago, we were living in Vancouver on the edge of a field by our church, and we had a mice infestation. And I was horrified, and I was, I almost had PTSD from it, not to make light of that condition, but just like, there were so many of them. We had a whole mice nest, whatever you call multiple mice in a group family thing together. And so I was putting out all these traps, and I started with cheese because that's what I always heard. Uh, growing up on the Tom and Jerry kind of thing, like, I thought, ah, surely cheese. So I would set it on that little apparatus there, that little cheese-like thing, and that little bugger would just nibble it off. He'd come by, and he'd, like, grab it. I never saw him actually do it, but, like, they'd, they'd get it off. And then it wouldn't spring. Until finally somebody told me, oh, you need to use peanut butter. That'll get them. And so then what I did was I put some peanut butter on it. And it had to be kind of messy. Like no really big distinction there. He couldn't just grab the hunk of peanut butter off. It had to be the creamy stuff, right? And so, and then, whap, it would get him. One of the things that I think is interesting is that that's kind of like what the enemy does to us. He puts something on, oh, and with the word sin, the, the idea of a stumbling block, it has this idea of a trap that's set. Where that little yellow apparatus thing would be a stumbling block where something is set. It's right there, it's triggered, and then... If you trigger that, then bam, you're dead. And what is fascinating to me is that that's kind of like what the enemy does to us is he uses situations and things to entice us to sin. Whatever your, your triggered sin might be. And... He might even create a messy situation to where you can't really tell the lines and you try to dance as close to the line as you possibly can and then, whap, you're caught. Whap, you're dead. And so from Proverbs, we get this wisdom from Solomon who, as Angie points out, if you ever want to talk about just a, a pet topic for her, she's like, Solomon was such a a strange example of a man of faith because he was supposed to be the wisest man and yet that man struggled with lust because you hear all the wisdom of how to try to avoid it but he uses this phrase in Matthew 5 or sorry Matthew 5 8 Proverbs 5 8 where Solomon says to his son keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of your house. If you're a little mouse and you're trying to get some food 
and you see food on this kind of a trap, don't go near it if you know that that trap is going to trigger you. Because chances are you'll be caught up in that, in that trap. So go ahead and go to the next slide. I want to share my testimony with you all this morning. I'm not going to go into all sorts of different details. Well, because I don't have time, Jim. That would be a couple hours. <laughs> we can have coffee sometime, and I'll, I might go into more detail. But the reason I want to talk about my testimony is because Jesus, he, he's speaking this to these people. He's really... He's saying, here's what the law and the letter of the law says, and I'm going to ratchet it up beyond what you would expect it to be, beyond even what the Pharisees say you're supposed to do. This is really the bar of the law. And so for me, in my life, since I was young, I have dealt with this issue of lust, uh, lusting after... Um, after women. And for me, uh, on my journey, God has met me in my mess where he has been so patient with me along the way, like a father, leading and guiding me and correcting me. And when, uh, where things really started where I think I really started my journey, it was my sophomore year, uh, well, uh, the summer of my sophomore year going into junior year of high school, and I went to this worship conference. I had been serving in church, had been growing up in church, had been doing all these things. All the while, as most young people do, I was flooded with hormones, and all other people flooded with hormones, and I was... I, my life exhibited more of Romans chapter 7 where I don't do what I want to do and I do do what I don't want to do and I'm just covered in doo-doo all the time. And so that's kind of what it feels like uh, being caught up in addiction or sin. And so uh, God met me and in that moment, at that place, I started to see victory but I, I wasn't out of the woods. And then, uh, uh, you know, um, a couple years later, I had started quasi-flirting, dating with a gal, and all of this lust that was in my heart came out in almost having intercourse with that gal. And, and you know, not married, we were just in college, and then she came at me and condemned me and said, oh, you're, you're supposed to be this man of God. How can you be a man of God? And like, you're, you're caught up in all of this. I don't want anything to do with you. And that shame carried with me through the rest of college. And even though God was continuing to meet me in my mess, continuing to meet me, and I was seeing some growth and some victory and some, you know, advancement, that really stole the joy from my marriage and from my relationship with Angie. And really, it ruined a lot of Angie's and my initial relationship. And I share all of this with you because it wasn't until about... Uh, a year, six months, nine months into being uh, married with Angie, I had started going to a Bible college because I thought, well, I need to pursue this thing of ministry, um, not really knowing what to do with my issue of lust. And the Holy Spirit started doing an overhaul on my life. And I started to see more victory, more space and time between relapses, more more opportunity of just experiencing God and who he really was. And it was in a chapel service where all my life I had been raised up and 
It's like everybody had told me, look, you're just a sinner. All you're ever going to do is sin, so you might as well get used to it. And, like, try your best, but you're still going to fail. And there was this moment. I was, I was a, a, a freshman in college and in worship. I was reminded of Romans chapter 8, where, where Paul writes, There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that, that started to break me. And it started to overwhelm me and started to change me and my heart. And that didn't mean that I didn't relapse. It didn't mean that I didn't mess up. But it means that God's grace was sufficient for me. And it means that I was free. And I started to experience more and more and more freedom. When 10 years ago, I started my longest stint of no relapse. My daughter Maggie was born, and that event completely just changed. Well, it, it kept me busy, friends, because, you know, newborn babies and all. But... Um, But it's been a long journey. And I, I'm happy to say, and I'm hum, I, I submit it to you, that I'm a little over two years clean and pure. And what has done it for me, uh, as we'll touch on in just a moment, is that I finally came to a point about three or four years ago where I said, I can't do this alone. I've been trying to do this alone, and I've been trying to figure out how to live rightly, and I don't know how to do it. And so finally I called up somebody who I knew struggled with the same thing I did, and we have been walking together and meeting once a week for the last three or four years. And that community and that camaraderie and that help of another person has completely transformed how I see the Christian experience. We need each other. I need you. And you need me not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a fellow brother in Christ, where the floor is level at the foot of the cross, and we are all dealing with something. Your issue may not be lust, or it may not be sexual in nature. It could be, and I'm not just going to harp on this one thing, but like, it could be alcohol. And Solomon has stuff to say about that too. I don't have the exact address, but he basically warns and says, don't stay a long time in the tavern staring at the wine, looking at the wine, seeing how it sparkles, seeing how, <laughs> like, don't, linger on wine if that's your issue instead cast it away i love how the the new king james even says it it says cut it off and cast it away it's like get that out of my life i don't even want it anymore but the beautiful thing is that with our testimonies really so that's our history that's my history of the ways I've experienced God and how God has proved faithful time and time again, even when I am faithless and unfaithful. But also that's his story of grace towards me and his story of compassion and how he has shown himself true through and through. And so that's why I love anchors because anchors are with you all the time when you're on a ship. And for me with anchors... As, as a thing that I, I, I value, it really is, it symbolizes my journey with God, where God has been with me through it all. And he's not, even though he is in the place of authority where he could condemn me, and he has every single right to condemn me and cast me away from him, he chooses to love me. 
And so I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but God loves you. And God is not here to smite you and to say, oh, you dirty sinner, oh, it's a good thing I'm here. Really, God wants you to know that he's like a father trying to help you back up again. There's this great verse in Proverbs that says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again. And so God is trying to help us continue on the journey that maybe you make it a few more steps along the way before you fall, but you still had those gains. So you can go to the next slide. So kind of continuing in this dealing decisively with our sin, there's this quote by a guy named Michael Green who wrote a commentary on Matthew. He says, deliberately to foster lust by erotic books, plays, films, magazines, and websites is to fly in the face of this commandment. For who is to know when the bridle of decency or convention will snap under the strain and the racehorse of our passions break loose? He, meaning Jesus, is telling us that we must deal with sin as drastically and radically as necessary and cut off avenues that we know to be unhelpful to cultivating that purity of heart, which is part of the blessed life, which we read about in the Beatitudes. Third takeaway from today, and we're, we're wrapping up here, but I want you to know you are not alone. Your habit or hang-up may not be the same as the person next to you, but you are not alone. If you need help, if you have nowhere else to go, or if you just want a place to start, you can come and talk to me. My door and cell phone are always open. And so anytime, day or night, if you want to talk, I, I'm available. You don't have to go this alone. And there, some of the motivation behind this, next slide, is that there's this verse that I think my pastor quoted in, uh, in his wedding homily at Angie's and my wedding. So it's, it's where Solomon, I'm saying a lot of, Solomon was an interesting guy in this regard. Okay, here we go. He says, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Uh, some translations might say are have tender buds there. So next slide. There's this, uh, this famous pastor writer named Watchman Nee, and he has this to say in his commentary on Song of Solomon. Um, big foxes go after the fruit of the vine, but little foxes break the tender vine branches. Though damage may be done by big foxes, you may still have a chance to bear some fruit. But with the damage done by little foxes, the chance of fruitage is almost destroyed. Unless we are very watchful, the life of the cross, prior to resurrection and the experience of ascension after resurrection, can be completely spoiled by little foxes. So basically, on this side of heaven, folks... If we don't take care of the little foxes in the vineyard of our heart, so to speak, we have, our heart will be spoiled. Next slide. He goes on to say, what are the little foxes? Every small appearance of the old life, a habit, a retrospective look, such are the little foxes. They are not necessarily grave sins, so like Jesus was talking about, it's not necessarily committing the actual physical act of intercourse, adultery, but it might just be that heart issue. In dealing with all small problems, the little foxes, the loved one, cannot withstand them single-handedly, nor can the king do it alone. There is need for cooperation. He is asking her that they war against these things together. And even though in the Song of Solomon, it's this dynamic between uh, the lover and his beloved, I would submit to you 
that we could e expand that idea to also include the community of faith, where if we have little foxes in our hearts that need to be dealt with decisively, then that means we can go to our brother or sister in Christ and say, I need help. And there is no shame in that. You might feel shameful about it because of just the effects of sin, but if you need help, get help. Because the freedom that Christ wants to bring you into and the life he wants to bring you into is worth it. So, God is not asking you to take on these foxes alone. You can go to the next slide. As we deal with our sin, we have the Holy Spirit as our guide to uh, guide us into all truth, to bring that conviction of sin so that as we read our Bibles and we become aware that I didn't know I was sinning when I did that certain thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You can confess and repent, and he is faithful and just to forgive you. Also, the community of faith, we've covered that. Also, safeguards. As drastic as, not the literal thing, as drastic as gouging out your eye and cutting off your hand. Safeguards. So, for example, if you have issues with your cell phone, you can actually exist with a dumb phone, folks. We all did it at some point in life, right? If you have an issue with social media, because the trap of media and marketing and everything, if you have an issue with that, delete the app off your phone. Then you'll get to see who your real friends are anyway, right? But, I mean, so if you need to take off Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any other host of social media apps, cut it off. If you need, if you're watching a movie and something comes across your line of sight, that bird flying over your hair so that it doesn't nest in your hair or bite off your nose, turn off the TV. Maybe cancel that subscription to a certain magazine or a certain thing or a what have you. Do something drastic and pursue God. Look to God. So after you've made that decision, don't just leave yourself empty. Fill yourself with the word of God. Fill yourself with prayer. Even if you're just crouched in a corner and you're crying out to God and you say, God, I need you. That's better than being caught up in lust of whatever the thing might be, whether it's illicit or not. And so there are safeguards that we can put up in our lives. Um, if you are a guy or gal who struggles with pornography, there are filters you can put on your devices to help you put up a safeguard against those websites and things that you might encounter. There's no e easy way to talk about all these things. And so that's, uh, next week we get to talk about divorce. Hallelujah. So here we go. So my point is, though, that we need to deal decisively with our sin. That's the thrust of what God is saying to us through Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. Because we can either experience and embrace that redemption in our heart and life, or we can let the little foxes ruin our hearts and steal away the joy and really kill us from the inside out. Final thing. In conclusion, actually, there's two more slides. Next slide. Okay. I'm not going to go there and read it, but it's worth a read, John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It's the moment where Jesus, who has already said these things, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, somehow they united around this idea, they brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. 
So she's, this poor woman has, you know, been caught up in this thing. Whatever might have led to that situation, she's, she was actually acting it out, or the guy she was with was acting it out with her. It's, we, we don't have those details. But for this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, how does Jesus approach her? Because I think that will tell us a lot about how he approaches us in this issue. And what he did was he did not condemn her. He, he did this thing, read it sometime, but uh, he, he basically called their bluff and said, you know, look, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And everybody left. And so then it's just Jesus and the woman. And he says, woman, who are, where are the people who condemned you? And he said, or she said, they've all gone. And so he said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And so Jesus meets us in our mess and shows his love to us and calls us to continue on the journey. Next slide. Final thing. Last thing. Robin, you can come up. Um, the fourth and final thing I want us to know from this passage is that you are loved by a God who is with you in every step of your process. Every step. He's with you. I think that's the beautiful thing about the Christmas season. We get to remember how God is with us. If, if we haven't known it throughout the year, we get to remember it. And how whether it's in the failure or the fulfillment or the somewhere in between, God is with us. And so, take heart. You are loved. And so, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you did not give up on me. And I thank you that you did not give up on my friends here this morning. And Lord, that we gather together as a family of grace where we are covered by your love and because we are hidden in you, Jesus, there's no condemnation the devil can throw at us. Lord, help us to deal decisively with our sin. Help us to cut out the things from our lives that are causing us to stumble like a, mice, uh, like a mouse stumbles into a trap. Help us, Lord. I pray that you would encourage my friends here this morning. Lord, may they draw closer to you in this new year as they experience more and more of your faithful love to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, would you stand with us as we close?
Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for sticking with me through the journey of that fun, fun passage by our Lord Jesus. So as we go from this place, as you go to your week and you start your new year, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great week.